when you see some of the indices, it looks like all is good in the Eurozone. And I think all is not yet good in the Eurozone. I would agree with you, given the, the situation we had got in and where expectations had been over the last two or three days, um, it was probably the best short-term outcome that we could have expected. Um, but of course, there are many, many questions still to be asked, not least of which you've still got two sort of extremist parties trying to figure something out, not really believing in the same ideology at all. Um, and that's going to be a challenge, I think, uh, for both of them going forward. And Cornelia Meyer, would you agree I would, with... I would absolutely agree, and I would actually go a little bit further than that. I would say we have the two parties, who one of them more right-wing, the other one more left-wing. Um, we had wobbles on who would be the finance minister. We have the new finance minister. I've read some of the stuff he has written, Mr Chair. Um, it's very much like um, what we had feared. He's very anti-euro. So for the eurozone, this is really bad news. And we have to see how long this government will last. And on top of that, we just have now a new government in Spain as well. We, and, and we all think that will last not through the end of the year. So we have... This is, this is bad, and it's even worse than it, the Greek crisis was, mm. because this is the continent's third largest economy. And once we are both British, we Britons have left um, the EU. Um, it will be the third largest economy in the EU. And is that uh, the possibly the biggest challenge of all of this is that we keep comparing this to Greece, uh, Guy Miller, that this could be even worse? Well, it has certainly the potential to be for the reasons I just mentioned. Um, I think throughout the 2012-2013 crisis, the fear was always about contagion. And it wasn't so much uh, along the smaller peripheral country, it was always about what does this mean for Italy? That was always the one that was the pivotal uh, uh, country within the Eurozone. What happens and what is good or bad for Italy is good or bad for the Eurozone. So I think we've drawn this now to a head whereby um, there is uh, risk. Now, I think the market forces, we still hope, uh, show the political um, direction that should be taken, namely, when we're worried about the fiscal slippage side, where we're worried about a breakup, bond deals, of course, spike. We saw the sell-off in, in markets. And up until now, it's been quite a good uh, form of discipline to the political establishment. But the trouble that we have now, of course, is with Italy, uh, is the danger is that they look beyond that, that the politics get in the way of that. And frankly, mistakes can be made. Although I will say that we certainly still have the belief that the Eurozone will not break up. And that enough will be done still to hold that together in the medium term, at least. And how does this impact, Cornelia, on the ECB? I mean, they're all for kind of slowing down on the quantitative easing. Has this really put a spanner in the works? It, it, it will put a spanner in the works. It has put a spanner in the works because um, if Italy really does a wobbly, which, which it may well do, because it's uh, up to now we had some sort of fiscal discipline and that may be all over, especially with the, um, um, especially with the Five Star Movement who want, um, the, who want this minimal, um, the minimal um, wage guarantee or the min minimal you know, uh, universal wage. You, we, we, if we do that, then it will be tough for Mr. Gragi to... And, and, and if you look at high, rate, rate hikes, it will be even tougher to do the rate, rate hikes. So, yes, and Europe really... The ECB really needs to readjust the way from where we were after the financial crisis, because if we don't have higher interest rates, come the next crisis, we don't have that lever. So how will they do that? Well, that's exactly the question. <laughs> it, it, throws, it, throws, it may well throw a spanner in the works. And it's, it, it, the, the bad thing is we have Italy and we have now Spain at the same time. So that's a bit, that's a bit tough. What is this risk of contagion around Europe? Are you concerned by Well, that? we're always concerned, really, through the banking mechanism, because I think people forget about the vulnerability of the Eurozone European banks and the exposure they've got not only to government debt, but across to, you know, cross-holdings as well. So if there is a major um, increase in, in, in pressure, it will be through the banking system, I think, that will come through. Um, but one thing I will say is that I think there is still a difference between Italy and Spain to some degree. I mean, Spain is an economy that has been doing a lot better. Um, I think the politicians... Uh, understand that the, the movement, you might not like Rajoy, but in terms of some of the, uh, the economic uh, direction, the beginning has been reasonable, unemployment is coming down, job opportunities have picked up, investment has been decent as well. So while it's easy and understandable, I think, to, to focus on the negatives, um, there is still a lot of good things that are coming through. And hopefully um, some of the politicians at least will look at that and learn from that and say, well, we can't be too extreme here.
Well, I, I would agree on Spain. On Italy, I'm actually even more negative than you are, <laughs> because I look at if I look at non-performing loans, non-performing debt, um, Italy is really the champion of that. Mm -hmm. If you can be a champion in Europe, and so I'm really Italy really worries me. Spain, yes, but we now have a sort of centre-left government. We had a centre-right government, and centre-left governments, well, may have a little bit different of an economic outlook in, in, um, in Spain. Geopolitically, how do you see the situation in Italy uh, developing? Well, geopolitically, I mean, it's bad for the Eurozone. I think geopolitically we have far bigger, we have far bigger wars, but I think it's bad for the Eurozone. And I think what, what, is, what is emerging now is that we're going away from the Goldilocks scenario. Remember when we all were in Davos? Um, it, it was everything's growing 3.9%, the whole world, everywhere. Now with an appreciating dollar, some of the emerging markets, namely Argentina, Turkey, are having problems. Um, we will have some issues in the the Eurozone, if we get tariffs on cars, then that will be bad for Germany. China is not quite growing as much as we expected it. So we, I think we are out of the Goldilocks scenario into a um, more bespoke growth scenario for the world. All right, we're going to talk about uh, trade just after the break. But Guy Miller, last uh, word on you. How do you see markets developing uh, given the situation we found ourselves in now? Well, I think maybe the Goldilocks to some extent is, is beginning to be tarnished somewhat. But I still think it's a reasonable one for markets. And we maybe touch on this later. The US data has been coming out still yeah. very strong. Profitability in most parts of the world, including Europe from a corporate perspective, has been good in terms of margins and revenues and reported earnings. And that's likely to continue, we think, for a number of quarters yet. And as an investor, when you look at the range of opportunities that you've got, I still think the equity markets uh, offer more upside in terms of the, uh, the fundamentals versus credit, which, of course, is late stage of the cycle, tends to underperform, and government bonds. Although there's problems, uh, you know, buying government bonds, you know, at, uh, you know, 0.3% in the case of 10-year uh, boons, not all that attractive. So certainly for the, the short to medium term, I still think that the equities have got a bit of wind, mm. although that wind is turning a look from, the, from the, the tailwind that they've had to more of a challenging uh, environment. And therefore, I think idiosyncratic risk and idiosyncratic factors will become much more meaningful. We talked about the Eurozone, Italy, but we can't go without talking about trade war. And, you know, this is it, isn't it, Cornelia? Protectionism in action. It's just protectionism in action. And I would at this point call it trade skirmishes, I think. But if we, if we develop this further, it will be a trade war. You don't um, think we've already reached that point? No, I think we're, we're still in the skirmish. We're still okay. in the skirmish point. So, you know, we have now the, we are now have the, the, the tariffs on steel and aluminium. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, some countries have given in. Um, South Korea has given in. Um, Brazil has given in to, to Trump, so they, they are exempt. So, but mm -hmm. it's now Canada, Mexico and Europe. So this is not good. Europe is retaliating. Um, this is not good. But I would not just look at what we are doing now. I would also look at the overhanging threat of imposing tariffs on cars, because that will be very bad for Germany. Mm -hmm. And I would also look at what's happening with the Chinese trade talks, because that's a little bit underreported. If China really goes ahead to purchase $40 billion worth of agricultural goods from the US, that will come from somewhere, and those will be European agricultural imports that will be replaced. So the talks this weekend between the US and China, this is going to be the, the make or yes. break point and the difference between trade skirmishes yeah, the and trade, trade war. wars, and, but it also, the way it comes out will mean, what does it mean for Europe? Because if China really gives in and says, OK, we are, we are now purchasing $40 billion worth of agricultural goods, they will purchase less agricultural goods from Europe. Do you think, then, that this all is riding on this weekend, then? No, I think it's not riding on this weekend, but we are, we are, I would say we are in a bullet train, in a nice Japanese bullet train, going in the direction of trade wars. Very quickly. <laughs> OK, Guy, uh, Miller, all this uncertainty that we've had over this for months mm. has caused massive volatility in the markets. And then suddenly, uh, this Friday, we're ending the week kind of on a high because it's everybody knows 
where we currently stand. And this is great for markets. Well, markets don't like volatility, so the fact that we've got some some surety in the, in the short term has helped to, to have a sort of a, a bit of a bounce. But again, we shouldn't extrapolate that. There's many big issues at play here. I think the trade side is was always our single biggest worry, sort of a year ago, because it is an area that the Trump administration can have a, a quick and direct uh, influence on. Um, but I would agree that I still think it's this kind of the, the trade tiff just now, rather than something more fundamental. I think it makes good press in America, uh, particularly when we get into a year of uh, the prime. Um, and I think that he can show at home that actually he's being fairly tough, even though it really doesn't mean very much right now. If you look at what's being uh, Im impacted in terms of steel and aluminium, it's small. But again, he can show that there's been a, uh, a movement in the direction that he promised in terms of his kind of manifesto. Um, but I think it gets much more serious from here on. We hope, of course, that this is more rhetoric than anything else and we can step back from that, as he's done a number of times, including with China as well. But the risks are clearly high. I'm interested to hear that you kind of both agree on this, given during the break you said that you were the optimist <laughs> yeah. and you were the pessimist when it comes to this discussion. But um, where do you think the strategy for markets will be now? Well, I, I still think from, from a market perspective, I think that, um, that the macro backdrop is still decent in terms of, I think we had a very soft Q1 for most parts of the world in terms of GDP. Uh, there's a bit of stabilisation coming through. Q2 looks to be better for most regions, including Japan, the US, um, and even in the Eurozone. So I think that's not a bad backdrop. And indeed, when we look at the inflation numbers, they're still fairly benign. They've picked up a little bit in the United States, but uh, still a long way off target in terms of Europe, a long, long way off target in terms of Japan. So the policy mix, I think, is still a, a decent one. And I think the Fed will uh, go fairly cautiously forward because there is a lot of risk still out there on a global basis. How do you think Europe will punish the US? Well, I think they will. In, they have now threatened. They will impose those tariffs, and they're very targeted. I mean, it's um, peanut butter and Harley Davidson and and all and whiskey, which goes nicely to congressional districts, which are uh, firmly Republican um, congressional well, districts. This, yes, could which really is not, hurt. which is not, which which is where it hurts. But it's it's not it's not really. It's not really helpful. And, and what I really would like to see is the US, uh, the, the, the Europe, and they will invoke, you know, they will go to the WTO. Uh, we, we really, the, the thing that worries me more about these skirmishes than anything else is that we're moving from a multilateral world, and trade only really works when it's multilateral, to a, to a bilateral world, and we need to give some more oomph uh, behind the WTO. One thing I would like to say, though, to, to, to counter you is, yes, so far, not so big, but if you're Canada, who is the largest steel importer to the, to the, to the US, then it does hurt a bit. And we saw Justin Trudeau today um, being quite outraged. Well, they were all quite outraged. I mean, Christine Lagarde, everybody's saying, you know, this is uh, just disaster. Everything is OK, except if we get to trade war. And here we are, trade skirmishes then. Uh, where do you, how much do you think the World Trade Organization can get involved? Well, you know, you have the. They can now. They can now use the um, the, the, the mediation um, mechanisms of the of the World Trade Organization. They can they, they they can use that. The problem is the WTO only works when everybody goes along. And the WTO and we saw with the Doha round where mm. it went nowhere that there were not enough people behind it, and it's very hard to 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 be really effective when the number one economy of the world is not behind you. I mean, there's two things I might just mention. Very Certainly. quickly. One is that, I mean, the, 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 the US is still kind of conforming to WTO rules, but very loosely. I mean, to say this is about national security yeah, is clearly ludicrous, uh, yeah. particularly with Mexico, uh, Canada. And Canada. And now, but one thing I think is important is when you look at other trade deals that are happening around the world, certainly into the back end of 2017, early into 2018, the rest of the world is continuing to make deals. They are continuing to link up. The Chinese are very good examples of that. Asia broadly are doing the same thing. So while a lot of focus is put on the US, and clearly it's the most important one, um, it's wrong to say that the, all the deals are, are off the table now and it's just about the US. There are other bilateral cross deals taking place. And that gives me a little bit hoped as an optimist. But, but of course, the US is critical here. But the US is critical. Yeah. And the thing is, if I look at all the, the bespoke regional deals, again, they're not, they're sort of, they're bilateral, they're multilateral, but regionally multilateral. The great thing about the WTO is that it should be about the world. OK, thank you both very much indeed for joining us for uh, this uh, special discussion this evening. I appreciate it very much indeed. Thank you.